pleasure to be here today. Thanks. I thank everyone for coming out to listen to the presentation and hear about my, 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 my book. Uh, growing up, I knew the basic history of my dad's World War II experiences. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. He was with the 8th Air Force stationed in England. He flew uh, bombing missions over occupied Europe. His plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time that he went overseas. His plane was shot down over Belgium in 1944, and he was missing in action for seven months. But it wasn't until I retired in 2009 that I actually had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. Uh, it was never my intention to write a book at that time. Uh, really, all I wanted to do was read and to organize all the material that my parents had kept from the war years. And there were two really significant items. One was a diary that my dad had handwritten while he was missing in action about his plane going down. And it was absolutely riveting, so much so that the, the, the account of his plane being shot down was uh, included in two different books that were written. Uh, one by Gerald Astor called The Mighty Eighth, about the Eighth Air Force, which was stationed in England. The Eighth Air Force was called the Mighty Eighth because of the number of planes they could put up on combat missions, numbering on the, the hundreds. And in December of 1944, they had 2,000 bombers and 1,000 fighters on one mission. Uh, the other book, First Over Germany, was by Russell Strong. Uh, it was about the 306 bomb group, which my dad was in. Russell Strong was a navigator in the 306 and became its historian uh, after the war. Uh, the motto for the 306 was first over Germany because it was the first bomb group to bomb a target within <coughs> Germany. And the other item of great interest were all the letters that my dad had written to my mother during the war. And sitting, sitting down and reading those was absolutely fascinating. And I became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. Uh, I started reading book after book about the air war over Europe. I went on the internet and spent countless hours uh, doing research, <laughs> downloading de declassified military documents. I started uh, joining a number of World War II organizations. Today I'm president of the 306 Bomb Group Historical Association. Started going to reunions, listening to veterans tell their stories. And then finally in 2012, uh, I decided to write a book. I was actually at a reunion of the 306 Bomb Group in Savannah, Georgia. And I came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it had to be told. And people needed to read about it. Uh, it took me four and a half years from the time I started my research to the time the book was published. It took me 12 months to actually write the manuscript and then another eight months to publish it. I published it myself. I formed a one-person limited liability company and then contracted with independent professionals for all the services associated with publishing a book, such as editing, cover design, interior layout, printing, etc. The book has done very well. It's won 17 National Book Awards since its release in August of 2014. And it's in all the major air museums across the United States, even the Smithsonian Air Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. But I might not have ever written the book if it wasn't for two Belgian gentlemen. The first is Paul Delahaye, seen here with my father in 1994 at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and of my dad's plane being shot down. And the other gentleman, Jacques Lelot, seen here with me in 2014 at the 70th anniversary. Both these men were young boys during the war and they saw firsthand the atrocities that the Nazis committed uh, during their occupation of Belgium from 1940 to 1944. <laughs> and later in life they became local historians and they interviewed uh, quite a few people that were either citizens or members of the Belgium underground and uh, recorded their testimony about the events that took place. I owe them a huge debt because the events that took place and the docu documentation of those events would have been lost forever if they hadn't have written it all down and provided it to me uh, to put in my book. Uh, they're both wonderful gentlemen. Uh, Paul actually died in 2013. Uh, Jacques, who I'm going to see next month, I'm going back over to Belgium. Uh, he's 75 years old. My dad didn't uh, join the Air Force or the Army Air Corps back then to begin with as a result of President Franklin Roosevelt implementing the first ever peacetime draft in the fall of 1940. My dad enlisted in the Army, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, 
At the time, the U.S. military was woefully weak. Uh, they ranked 18th in the world in military strength behind Romania. And as you can see here, my dad wearing this old World War I uniform, they were very ill-equipped as well. Uh, three months later in July, uh, my dad married Ruth Hempel. Uh, she was born in Pasadena, as was I. This is their wedding picture at First Lutheran Church in, uh, in Pasadena. It was shortly after she graduated from UCLA. My dad was actually born in Norfolk, Nebraska, and then moved to Glendale when he was 13. That December, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, and the United States went to war. Uh, at that, during the Christmas time of that year, my mother went up to visit my dad over the holidays, and nine months later, Susan Ruth was born. Well, my dad was feeling a little pressure. He had a brand new bride, a baby on the way, and he felt, how am I going to be able to support my family on, his, on a private's pay in the Army? So he decided to join the Air Force where he could make a little more money, and especially if he could make it through pilot school and become an officer. In June of 1942, uh, he went through pre-flight training here in Santa Ana, and then he went through the various stages of pilot training. This slide's a little difficult to see, but there were three basic stages uh, of pilot training. The first was primary, and then if you could make it through that, you went into basic, and in basic, they split the pilots out before they went into advanced training. Uh, they either went into single-engine fight planes or fighters, or they went into advanced two-engine planes or bombers or transports. Typically, the shorter pilots went into single-engine planes or fighters because of the cramped conditions in the cockpit of fighters. Uh, my dad was almost six foot three, so he wouldn't fit in there too well. But also, it was determined by personality. The, the fighter pilots tended to be a little more individualistic, uh, risk takers, a little cocky, um, and the uh, bomber pilots tended to be a little more level-headed and, and team players. Here you see my dad in uh, primary training at Santa Maria in California. I think pretty much everyone smoked back then. These are the three planes that he flew during the three stages of pilot training. At Santa Maria, he flew an old Stearman biplane and then in basic training, he flew a Vulti Valiant uh, single wing aircraft. He went through basic in Lemoore, California, and Marana, uh, Arizona. And then in advanced training, he flew a uh, Curtis Wright uh, twin engine plane. He graduated from advanced training in Douglas, Arizona in April of 1943, where he received his pilot's wings and his commission as a second lieutenant. Then he went to transitional, crew tr transitional training, where he learned how to fly a four engine B-17, and after that, he went to operational crew training in Dalhart, Texas, where the various members of the, of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. Then on October 21st of 1943, they reported to the 306 Bomb Group at Thrilly, England. This is what the airfield looked back then. It's no longer there. There's a nice little museum there, though. But the countryside pretty much looks the same. It's all farmland, rural, with little country roads. Uh, running through it. It's, it's very quaint. My wife and I visited there in, in 2014. Here you see the insignia of the 306 bomb group. There were three air divisions in the 8th Air Force. They were part of the first air division signified by the triangle. And uh, each bomb group had a letter designation. H was the 306th. Some of you might remember or recall the movie uh, 12 O'Clock High starring Gregory Peck. Well, that was uh, based on a true story about the 306 bomb group. Uh, the fictitious bomb group in the movie, the 918th, was derived by multiplying the 306 by 3. Okay. There were four squadrons in the, in the bomb group. You had the uh, 367th uh, Clay Pigeon, so named by a journalist because they took such heavy losses during the war. Then you had the uh, Clay Pigeon, I mean the uh, Eager Beavers, the Grim Reapers, and then my dad's squadron, the 369th Fight and Bitin'. I always like to show this next slide because it's of the ground crew. Uh, the combat crew has got all the glory and the recognition, but these guys really kept these planes flying. They really considered the plane theirs and they just lent it to the combat crews to fly on, on, on missions. But when these planes came back after a mission, these guys would stay up all through the night doing maintenance, repairing battle damage, rearming the plane, ref refueling. So they were really the unsung heroes. Here you see my dad's crew. A B-17 had a 10-man crew. 
they had four officers. My dad, in the lower left, was the first pilot. And then you had the co-pilot, the navigator, and bombardier. And then you had six enlisted men, or non-commissioned officers, who were mainly gunners. Uh, five of these men made it back. Five of them did not. This is not the Susan Ruth. That's just the plane that they took their picture in front of when they arrived in England. You'll notice the, the nose art up here. I love the nose art. Uh, it's interesting that the Eighth Air Force, or the Air Force, I should say, was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The Marines did not, uh, or the Navy did not, neither did any other country. But Eighth Bomber Command thought it would help morale if they could let these young guys paint their planes and personalize their planes. And they're very creative in what they named their planes and painted on their planes. Oftentimes it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a nude woman. The 306 Bomb Group flew B-17 bombers, uh, nicknamed a Flying Fortress because of the armament that they carried on the plane. They carried 12 to 13 50 caliber machine guns. Also, they could take a tremendous amount of battle damage and keep flying. Again, you see the triangle H on the tail that uh, identified that plane as part of uh, the 306 bomb group. There were three different models of B-17s flown in the war. This is the later model of B-17G, which you can tell by the, the chin turret under the nose. Here you see the crew positions on the plane. In the, up front in the plexiglass nose, you have the uh, bombardier, behind him the navigator, then the two pilots up above him, the top turret gunner who was also the flight engineer. Then you have the bomb bays separating him <coughs> from the radio operator, ball turret gunner, two waist gunners, and a tail gunner. Uh, the, the bombs hung on racks on each side of the plane. This, this slide's a little difficult to see, but you'll see the bombs hanging up here on one side of the plane. And then there was a narrow catwalk, eight inches wide in between them. And this boy's only eight years old, so you can see how narrow uh, that catwalk was. And it wasn't uncommon for bombs to get hung up in the racks, and one of the crew members would have to take a wrench and knock it loose or kick it loose with his foot. So you can imagine what that must have been like. Been like. When those Bombay doors are open, he's looking straight down to the earth, five miles down below, yeah. the wind howling all around him. So that must have been pretty nerve wracking doing that. Here you see the crew positions a little more clearly. Again, you have the bombardier up front. This was the earlier model, the F model that doesn't have the chin turret. His job is to bomb the, uh, or drop the bombs accurately, but on the G model, when they were under attack, he also manned the chin turret. Then you had the navigator. He needed to know where they were going and where they were. And then the two pilots up above him. You needed two pilots, uh, most obviously, because if one was injured or killed, you had another pilot to fly the plane. But you needed two pilots just to f share the duty of flying the plane. It was very strenuous, both mentally and physically. These missions lasted eight to 10 hours. And flying in tight formations, they had to stay real alert or else they'd run into a plane in front of them or clip a wing on a plane next to them. Also, they had to fight the turbulence, not only the turbulence from the air, and I'm sure all of you have been in planes where you, you drop and bounce around, but having this many planes in the air at one time, all that prop watch and chop from all the engines really uh, stirred up the air and caused it very difficult to fly. Again, you have the flight engineer who manned the top turret uh, when they were under attack. But his main function was also to help the pilots monitor all the instruments in the plane. There were only over 150 different toggles and switches and gauges. Uh, so the flight engineer helped the pilots monitor engine performance and fuel consumption. And then behind the bomb bay, you have the radio operator. That was the most comfortable position on the plane. He had a nice chair to sit in and a roomy compartment. And then the most cramped position on the plane was the ball turret gunner down here. And again, these missions were eight to 10 hours. So this guy is curled up in a fetal position for all that length of time. And you can imagine how comfortable that must have been. Actually, the ball turret was the safest position to be in the plane. A lot of people think it might be the most dangerous, but it wasn't. And then up above the ball turret gunner, again, you have the two waist gunners and then the tail gunner, which is also a very cramped position. On November 3rd of 1943, my father and his crew flew their first combat mission. Uh, I was on a bombing mission to Wilhelmshaven, Germany. Uh, it was the first mission where the 8th Air Force had over 500 bombers. And flying combat was brutal and it was dangerous uh, from the time you take, took off to the time you landed. 
it, it, was, it, was, it was very, very difficult. To begin with, uh, you had 40 bomb groups in an area called East Anglia uh, here in, in England. It's about the size or area of Vermont. So on the day of a mission, you had hundreds of planes taking off from all these bases at the same time. And back then, there was no air traffic control. There was no radar. Everything was based on visual sight. And usually, the English weather was overcast, and you couldn't see anything until you got above the clouds. So mid-air collisions were not uncommon. And then they had to form up. Individual planes had to form up into uh, elements. Elements formed up into squadrons. Squadrons formed up into bomb groups. Bomb groups formed up into combat wings. Combat wings formed up into uh, divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they ever headed across the English Channel uh, on their mission. And then they had to deal with the elements. Uh, these planes were not pressurized, so above 10,000 feet, they needed to go on oxygen, or else they'd pass out. In a couple of minutes, they'd be dead. Also, they had to deal with the cold. It was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero in these planes. So frostbite was a, a major problem. A lot of these airmen were hospitalized with uh, frostbite injuries. Here you see a waist gunner in a typical uh, combat uniform. Has a steel helmet on, uh, tinted goggles because of the brightness at that altitude. Uh, again, the oxygen mask they had to be on. This is a flak jacket. It was like an apron that had uh, metal plates in the front and back to protect them. And you have the thermal uh, fleece line jacket, thermal uh, boots and gloves. And you see here at the white part, that's a parachute harness. They didn't actually wear their parachutes in the plane because it was too cramped. Uh, if they needed to bail out, they had to have the wherewithal to find their parachute and then uh, hook it on the, the, the clamps on the back of the harness and then, then bail out. When they neared the uh, mainland of Europe, then they had another problem, and that was they had to deal with German fighters. The Germans had radar stations along the, the coast and knew when these formations were going to reach uh, mainland Europe, and they were those German planes, uh, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, were just waiting for those formations. Here you have a, a waist gunner firing his 50 caliber machine gun. Again, his flak jacket here, all these spent cartridges on the ground. Uh, they were all clipped together in, in a belt that would feed the, uh, the gun here. At the beginning of the war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these bombers flying in tight formations with all that armament could defend themselves against the German fighters, but that turned out not to be the case. In 1942 and 1943, the 8th Air Force took devastating losses. Uh, finally, they gave them some fighter su support, but the problem initially was that those fighters, the P-38 Lightnings and the P-47 Thunderbolts, didn't have the fuel capacity to escort the bombers all the way to the target and back. They could make it just in, over uh, mainland Europe a little ways, and they had to turn back to England. Well, the German fighters would just hover in the air and just wait for them to turn around, and then they'd swoop down on them. Here you see what was called a combat box formation. Uh, and this was designed to uh, interlace all the firepower from these planes. With the, and the thought that they could defend themselves. This is uh, a box of a combat wing. Within the combat wing, you had three combat groups. So the 306 would have been in one box and two other combat groups within those boxes. And then three squadrons in boxes inside of those. Here you see a little different view uh, from on top of the formation from the side and then here uh, head on. Once they got closer to the target, then they had another problem to deal with, with and that was anti-aircraft fire. Here you see a German anti-aircraft cannon. They fired shells about 20 a minute, and they were calibrated to explode at the same height that the formation was flying. And when these shells exploded, they were full of all sorts of shapes and sizes of metal, pieces of metal called shrapnel that would just burst out hundreds of feet. They could easily penetrate the skin of these planes. The aluminum skin was so thin you could take a screwdriver and just poke right, right through it. From a distance, the flak, it was called, it was an abbreviation of the German word for an aircraft cannon. They looked like little innocent black puffs, but as you got closer and closer, those puffs got bigger and they started rocketing these ships. You can imagine uh, the adrenaline in these airmen when they saw those shells exploding up ahead and knew they had to fly right into them. A direct hit 
it would basically disintegrate the plane and it'd disappear. If it hit a wing, it'd knock it off, they'd drop like a stone. So they always had that fear. They hated the flak more than they did the fighters, because at least the fighters, they could, they could fight back. As they got very close to the target, they reached a point called the IP, the initial point. And that's where the first pilot gave command of the plane over to the bombardier, who flew the plane through this device called a Norden bomb site. It was revolutionary at the time. It was an analog computer that could calculate the speed of the plane, crosswind, uh, wind speed, so the bombardier could ac accurately drop the bombs. Here you see the bombardier looking through the crosshairs of the Norden bomb site. When he dropped the bombs, he would yell bombs away, and then the first pilot would take control of the plane again, and then they would all peel off and go to a point called the rally point where they'd try to form up again and then head back to Europe. It was on a mission to Frankfurt on February 8th of 1944 where my dad's plane dropped his bombs successfully, but their bomb bay got hit by flak and they couldn't get the bomb bay doors back up. And as a result, that caused a drag on the plane and they lost airspeed and couldn't keep up with the formation heading back to England. And they were picked out or singled out by two Falk Wolf German fighter planes who came in and swooped in to attack the Susan Ruth. And in the ensuing air battle, the Susan Ruth was shot down. Although both those German fighter planes were shot down as well. Uh, one piloted by Siegfried Merrick uh, crashed and he died in the plane. The other was piloted by Hans Berger who bailed out and he made it through the war. When I was doing my research, my wife uh, asked me one day, well, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? I thought, well, the, there's no way I'm going to be able to do that. It's a crazy idea. But being a good husband, I listened to my wife. And lo and behold, I found Hans Berger. And uh, fortunately for, for me, he became a, a translator after the war and speaks perfect English. So we communicated by email and over the phone. And he gave me some wonderful insight about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. Here you see a picture of the Susan Ruth after it came down. This picture was taken by an unknown Belgium. There's over 200 time period photographs in the book of the people involved and the places where the events took place. Uh, the helpers of my dad sent him a tremendous amount of pictures uh, from the war. And also the two Belgium gentlemen I mentioned, Paul Delahaye and Jacques Lelot, provided me with lots of pictures from that time era as, era as well. My dad, being the first pilot and commander of the plane, was the last one to bail out. Uh, again, this picture was sent to him by one of his helpers who actually helped him out of these trees. His parachute came down. It was around noontime. And they got hung up in the trees, and he was dangling 20 feet off the ground and couldn't get down. Fortunately for him, there were a couple of young Belgian farmers that saw his plight. Uh, they went back to the farmhouse, got a, to, a ladder to help him down. They told him to stay put until nightfall because there were German patrols combing the area looking for these airmen that had bailed out. Mm -hmm. That night they came and, and got him and took him to this farmhouse, which is still there today. Uh, it's right on the French border. In fact, these trees are in France. He stayed there one night. Uh, they didn't think it was uh, safe for him to stay there any longer than that one night because of the German patrols uh, in the area. And a Belgium customs officer by the name of Paul Tilqueen came and got him on a tandem bicycle. He brought a, 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 another uniform that my dad changed into, and they headed out. It was pitch black, uh, middle of the night, raining cats and dogs. And my dad had shrapnel wounds in one leg, so he could only pedal uh, when the pedal came around with his, with his good foot or his good leg. They came to a hill, and he wasn't able to pedal anymore, and so they had to get off and push the bike up the hill. At the top of the hill was a cabaret or a little cafe. Uh, the lights were on, music was playing, there was laughter coming out of the cafe. When they got up near it, two German officers came walking out with uh, young girls, uh, their arms around young girls. One of them came up to my dad, put his arm around him, and asked for a light for a cigarette. My dad couldn't speak any German, so he was scared to death. Fortunately, Paul could. He gave him a light, and uh, the Germans let him go on their way. I guess they were too uh, drunk and too interested in their girls to pay these guys much attention. And my dad had several close calls, uh, almost being captured by the Germans, which are described uh, in the book. Uh, my dad became good friends with Paul uh, 
and his, especially his wife Nellie. Paul was arrested and sent to prison and tortured. He narrowly escaped being executed, but it did break his health and he died in his mid-50s. From there, my dad was moved around from place to place. Uh, how long he stayed in any particular house depended on how brave the people were that lived there and also how dangerous the underground thought it was for him to stay there. Here you see two of his helpers, Ghislaine Bayou on the left and uh, Jeanette Gadin on the right. Uh, Jeanette's husband was a captain in the French army. He had been captured by the Germans and spent the war in a prisoner of war camp. But he, my dad, uh, corresponded with these helpers uh, after the war. Uh, typically, when an airman bailed out and evaded capture, the underground tried to get him back to England, uh, down through France, over the Pyrenees, into Spain, and then out through British-controlled Gibraltar. But something always went wrong trying to get my dad out. And you could imagine uh, the stress you'd be under uh, being a downed airman. You're in a foreign land. You don't know what happened to your crew buddies. You can't speak the language. You can't communicate back, back home. And at any moment, the Gestapo can come in on and raid the house and arrest you and either send you to a prisoner of war camp or, or you, could, you could be shot. So finally, my dad got tired of hiding. So he decided to join the French resistance, the group called the Mackey. They were a guerrilla group that harassed the, uh, the Germans, sabotaged convoys, uh, uh, executed or not executed, but shot German officers with it when, when they could. This was the farmhouse that the Mackey group stayed in. This was actually just across the border in, in France. And this, this farmhouse is still there today. Uh, my dad stayed in the upper rooms. So another little uh, vignette is one day that my dad was shaving. He just had his skivvies on and uh, shaving cream in his face. And a German troops came up the, up the road. And he had to jump out the, the windows there and hightail it into the, the woods. Whoops. Sorry about that. Here's another pretty incredible picture. It shows my dad jumping out of a Jeep with the Mackey group on one of their escapades uh, and fighting the Germans. Finally, my dad was liberated on September 2nd, uh, seven months after he was missing in action by Patton's Third Army mm -hmm. when he came up through France after D-Day. He was liberated in a little French town called Trélone. So you might realize that uh, Brussels is really separated <laughs> it's in two parts. The upper half is called Flanders, where they speak Dutch, and it's rather industrial, the larger cities. And the lower half of Belgium is called Wallonia, where they speak French, and it's very rural, all farmland, and just basically made up of little hamlets and villages. And my dad's plane and, and most of the crew uh, came down right around here, again, right at the French border. My dad was hidden in Charleroi for a little bit. Uh, that the farmhouse where the resistance group was was right over the border, and then Trelone was right about here. I've been to Belgium three times. It's a wonderful country, and the people are just wonderful as well. To this day, they're so thankful and grateful for the Americans coming to their rescue and liber liberating them from Nazi occupation. Uh, they have uh, celebrations there every year. Uh, this is a poster from 2014 when I went back. And the celebrations last several days. Uh, they erect a huge tent. Uh, this is just part of it that can seat hundreds and hundreds of people. And we have a grand old time. You have dances, uh, band concerts. They have lunches and dinners. All the local helpers dress up in uh, World War II vintage uniforms. And the local beer Chimay flows freely. Everyone has a real good time. They also have ceremonies at various memorials around the area. Uh, this is the one at Sendron, which is right at the French-Belgian border where the 9th Infantry, the U.S. 9th Infantry, first crossed over into France to liberate Belgium. And all the local villagers come out, all the local dignitaries are there, the U.S. Army, the Belgium uh, military, French military. Uh, this, in 2014, even uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Belgium, Denise Bauer, came down and she invited me and my family over to her residence at the embassy in Brussels, which was very special. Uh, they also have ceremonies at this memorial, which is the Susan Ruth Memorial. It's in the little village called Mackinwas, uh, pretty close to where the, the plane came down. On the front are plaques that have the names of the crew, their ages at the time that they crashed down, were bailed out, were shot down, and their positions in the crew. 
This is Hans Berger today, that German Luftwaffe pilot that shot down my dad's plane. He's 92 years old. He lives in Munich, Germany. I'm going to go visit him next month and film him. I've never met him in person. This picture was taken by my youngest son, who happened to be in, in Germany. My dad wanted to visit the World War II Memorial before he died, uh, so I accompanied him on a reunion for the Air Force Escape and Evasion Society back to Pennsylvania, and we took a bus down to Washington, D.C. It was just before its official dedication in 2004. Uh, my dad wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest crew member to die at age 91. And virtually all of the World War II vets in their, are in their 90s today. At one time, there were 16 million World War II veterans, and today 95% of them are no longer with us. There was no other event in history that affected more people than World War II. 60 million people died, millions more were wounded, millions more uh, homeless and displaced. It changed the course of America and the world forever, and the brave young men who fought and died for freedom are surely members of the greatest generation. We can never forget their sacrifice, and it's our duty to remember. Thank you. Wow. I'd be glad to take some questions if anyone has any. Yes, sir. Were the two German planes that shot Susan Ruth down, shot down themselves by the, uh, by the uh, guns from that aircraft or from fighters? Yeah, the, the Susan Ruth gunners, uh, I'm not sure which one, shot down Hans Berger's plane, but they're unsure actually who was credited with shooting down Siegfried Merrick's plane. It was really difficult to tell who shot down planes there. The closing speed in those planes was so fast, and you have all these gunners shooting them at, at them at the same time. So really identifying a, a kill uh, was difficult. Yes, sir. Father have to bail out then, or was he able to fly the airplane down to the ground? Um, well, two of the crew died in the plane, and the other eight bailed out. So the plane came down. My dad put it on auto autopilot uh, before he bailed out, and the plane didn't come straight down. It kind of, kind of swirled down. The tail fell off, and one of the engines fell off. And then did he find out what happened to the other eight members? He never knew at all what happened to his crew uh, until he got back to England. And even uh, then he found out that two of them had died, some of them were in prison camps, and there were three that were still unaccounted for, which he, th he thought they were in prison camps. Yes, sir. What tour was he on when, he got, when the plane went down? He was on his eighth mission. Eighth? Yeah, he had, fl he had flown two more, uh, but they were recalled because of weather. His other uh, crew members actually had more missions than him. He was the center on the basketball team, and he tore the ligaments in his ankle, and he couldn't fly for two months. So some of his other crew members actually had more missions than, than he did. How long was it before uh, your mother found out <clears throat> that he was living? You said he was missing in action for six months? Seven months, and it was probably eight months before. Uh, on, the plane went down on February 8th. On February 23rd, she got a telegram from the War Department saying that he was missing in action. Uh, and that April, my other sister was born, so my dad didn't even know what, he always thought he was going to have a boy. In the letters, he always called the baby Steve or Stevie, uh, but it came, turned out to be Nancy. Um, and then she, my mother didn't know that he was alive until he came back to, to England uh, in September, and he sent her a telegram. With those tight formations, how were they able to not shoot each other? That's a good question, and it comes up uh, all the time. Uh, I'm not exactly, exactly sh sure. They had certain cones of fire and that, they, that they practiced, and, and some of the, the guns, I think, you know, were calibrated that they could only swing so far. But all that interlocking fire, you'd think they would hit each other. After my get dad got back to England, then he came home. If you were shot down over enemy territory, you couldn't fly again, because they thought if you were shot down a second time and you were captured by the Germans and tortured, you'd give up the identity of those people that helped you the first time that you were shot down. 
there were, if you were shot down over, you know, once after D-Day and then the, the troops came in and started uh, occupying France and Belgium and Netherlands, and if you were shot down over U.S. occupied territory, then you could fly again. So did he learn, learn enough French to be able to, to talk to the people he was ser serving with in the mob? Um, yeah, well, in the escape kit of every crewman, you had a little French-English you know, dictionary. But by the time, after that seven months, my dad said he could speak pretty good conversational French. It's like, shoot. And... Well, he could, he could, because <laughs> yeah, there, at one of the houses he was at, there was a 16-year-old girl, Mimi Gabriel was her name, that they used to play cards and play Monopoly, and she would teach him French. Those, the, the people that hid and aided those uh, down airmen were incredibly brave. Um, they were not only putting their, their own lives in danger, but those of their family as well. And some of the people that helped my dad or other members of the crew were arrested, sent to prison camps, and some lost their lives. Why is that tail got a position not the most vulnerable on the plane? Why well, wasn't the tail? Or the ball. Or the ball? Yeah. Well, it, you're kind of hidden underneath the, the plane. So, and also, most of the attacks were from above, either from the front or from the back. And so they didn't really come up from beneath the plane. Mm -hmm. What about the most dangerous part? Um, the bombardier, you know, and then the navigator, because they're in that, that plexiglass nose and pretty vulnerable. Mm -hmm. The pilots kind of had a tight space uh, where they were, they were sitting. Yeah, the two men that died in the plane were the ball turret gunner. I said that was, wasn't the most dangerous position. <laughs> and the radio operator. Do you have an idea what the total number of B-17s was that was in the flight uh, where your dad was shot down? And um, how many B-17s were lost from that flight? Um, it's in my book, but I forget off the top of my head how many uh, bombers were flying that mission. But his was the only, his plane was the only plane that was shot down on that, on that mission. I mentioned how dangerous it was to fly uh, combat. There were uh, 26,000 uh, men in the 8th Air Force that uh, lost their lives in combat. That was more than the entire uh, Marine Corps okay. during World War II. And there was another 28,000 airmen that became prisoners of war after their planes were knocked out of the sky. It was the most dangerous uh, job in the, in, the, in the Army. That's not the way we to put it, really, but of, of even more dangerous than being in infantry. We used to say as kids, bombs away. I never even knew what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being so narrow, dropping the bombs by hand if you had to. Mm -hmm. Let's hope it never happened again. Well, you think we'd learn our lessons, but it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> and I salute the World War II veterans that are here with us today. Definitely members of the greatest generation. Yes, sir. I, I may have missed it, but how, how long was your father between the time he um, was shot down and reunited with the troops? How long was that period? Uh, seven months. Yeah, the, uh, his Mackie group had set up an ambush for a convoy, and they, the, the convoy didn't show up, and then he heard that there were American troops in this little village of Trelon, France. So he went over there, went up to a captain, uh, army captain, and introduced himself and identified himself, and then he went to, to Paris from there uh, with some prisoners that they were taking over, German prisoners, and then they flew him back to England. He was at his base in England for a little while, and then they went back to the U.S. Wow. What did your dad do after, since he couldn't be a pilot, what did he do after? Uh, he was a flight instructor for a while, and then he had to crash land his plane in Ohio, and then he said, that's it, I'm not flying anymore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he was a, f a flight instructor in Florida for a while, then Ohio, and then uh, he was in the reserves until 47, and he, he went out as a captain. Then, what year did he die? 2007. Oh, 2007. And were, did you do research together before that? Or you said you hadn't been planning the book at that time, but did you do research with him at that time? Was he interested? Uh, no research. Um, I did accompany, my wife and I accompanied my parents uh, in 1994 
to the 50th anniversary celebrations in Belgium. And that's really when it became personal for me because I got, I actually met uh, Nellie Till Queen, one of his uh, helpers, and saw those places where it was hidden. So, you know, that's when it really became real for me. Like most World War II vets, uh, he didn't talk about it much. Um, it wasn't until he went over and the three other living crew members in 1989 to the dedication of the memorial to him and his crew. And there he was reunited with lots of his helpers that he hadn't seen since the war, saw those homes where he had been hidden, and that brought it all back. And then he started talking about it uh, more after that. Yeah, I am very, very fortunate to have as much history and know about uh, so much about my war, dad's time in the military. Uh, most uh, kids don't know hardly anything about what their dad did because they didn't talk about it. And the, you know, these gentlemen, they just looked at it as a job to be done. They did their job and they came over and put it behind them. Yeah. Uh, great men. So you spent many hours interviewing your father? Um, not so much interviewing. Uh, at that reunion that we went to the uh, World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., they filmed him uh, about an hour uh, interview. It's on YouTube. Uh, but I, you know, like again, most kids, I wish I had uh, asked a lot more questions that I, than I did. You know, I have a whole list of them I could have, uh, I could have asked him. But from all the letters that he wrote to my mother, and he was a very candid in these letters. He talked about combat missions. He talked about what life was like in London, what life was like in the base. He talked about escapades that some of his crew members would get in. Um, so I learned a great deal from, from those letters. And then he would talk about it, the trip to, to Belgium. And then the, some of the other surviving, surviving crew members wrote uh, kind of uh, reaccounts, not diaries per se, but different letters, and then all the research that uh, Jacques Lalo and Paul Delahaye did. So you're the youngest child? Yes, I wouldn't be here if my dad hadn't come back. <laughs> my mother said it was the best mistake they ever made. <laughs>